But if we try to communicate with a cow, their main means of communication in life is with eyesight. Think about where we locate ourselves most of the time when we're trying to work a cow. Where is that? Behind them. Where is the only place they can't see? Behind them. So we set ourselves up for failure to start with because we're on the wrong end of the cow a lot of times. And so if we don't change our position, we'll never get the cow to understand what we're asking them to do. And so it's going to be our responsibility. She's built in. That's the way she's wired. She's a prey animal. Never let them perceive us as a predator. Because what's the two responses you get out of that? Fight or flight. Neither one of them work out very well for you, do they? So you don't ever want a cow to perceive you as a predator or even the potential to be a predator. So your movements, your interaction, your communication with a cow is critical in letting them know that everything's all right and you're just interacting with them. You're just another animal. All right? We all don't want to admit we're just another animal, but we are just another animal. All right, the other way they like to communicate or will communicate is through sound, right? That's why they have the bella. They can holler every once in a while if they need to. They don't actually prefer to communicate that way. Most of it's eyesight. But we can use sound to communicate with cattle, but we don't want to let it be at a high decibel. And I like what you said yesterday. Glenn and I were on a program doing this yesterday, uh, talking about some people just have voices that are irritating to cattle. And those same people are pretty irritating to me most of the time, if you ever notice that. A lot of it has to be with volume and the continuity of that conversation sometimes. So we have to be careful about letting people make more racking. And the hardest thing you're ever going to do is try to change your own habits. And the only thing harder than that is try to get somebody else to change theirs. Until they want to change, it's very difficult. We talked yesterday about selecting people that want to do some things the same way in a similar fashion so that you have some assistance. Because part of the problem we get into, there's not enough people that are willing to change to do some of this stuff. So we may have to work cattle with fewer people. All right, communication. Now notice as the racket started, what did we all do? Looked at it. Great example. I'm glad I picked up on that. Everything stopped and we looked at it. Whatever I was trying to do, whatever I was doing stopped because there was too much racket distracting what we were doing. All right, if you start making a lot of racket around the cow, same thing's gonna happen. Her focus is gonna go to the racket, not what you're asking her to do. And normally what you're asking her to do is on the opposite end of the racket because you're on the wrong end of her. So if you start making racket, she turns her head over here, what's the logical direction she'll go? A cow goes where her nose goes. If her nose is over there and pressure starts, she's gonna go that way. Now she's at least gonna turn and face that direction. So then you gotta take the time, turn her back around, get her started again, and go on. So the best thing is not to make that racket, don't distract them, work more from the front, draw their attention forward, and let them go by you. So that's one thing we're gonna talk about doing with these cattle is learning to communicate with them, learning to push on an eye, pull on an eye. And with two heifers, I hope they just bring four panels. We normally set up a bigger pen, but it looks like a four panel deal. These uh, heifers, when I first approached them in the corral out there, they didn't seem to have a lot of desire for me to push on an eye. When I say push on an eye, if I were to look at Glenn's, if I'm looking at him right now, and I want to push on an eye, can I do it? Yes. No, because he don't know which eye I'm pushing on. Right now, I'm face up on him. That's if I step to this side, yeah. step in and put pressure, then he knows I'm pushing on that eye. This angle, that's where you're at, buddy. So you've got to take the time to reposition yourself. Don't worry about hollering at the cow and making her go somewhere. Step to the side, change your angle, and put pressure on her. Now, if I wanted to draw Glenn's eye around, how would I do that? What if I go on around here? What, look, look at Glenn, he's looking at me. He don't trust me, right? 
So you're going to watch me. You're a smart man. That's what we just found out about if he that. hadn't watched me, I'd have slapped him in the back of the head. He'd have watched me next time. But as you move around somebody, their natural tendency, even a cow, is to shift that head. So if you keep doing it long enough, they're going to change your body position because that's uncomfortable. And so you can turn one by drawing on an eye. We're all familiar with a flight zone on cattle. That means that area around one of them, when you walk up to them, they decide to go somewhere else. The rate of speed at which they decide to leave varies greatly, right? <coughs> Gentle cattle will just move away from you. Wild cattle, as soon as they see you invade their space, which may be a half a mile away, they may leave. <laughs> and so if you've got cattle like that, and I know some of you are talking about buying yearlings, that's the perfect time. As soon as they get off the trailer or truck at your place, you need to start this. So you start your interaction with those cattle right at that moment, teaching them to un take pressure, work that flight zone down to where you can get in closer proximity to them. The best thing to do is work those cattle in a large enough area where they can get away from you. Because if you start working them in a small area and they can never escape the pressure, it just freaks them out. They don't ever see an out. So once again, if you get something like this where you could walk down there and the cattle run away from you, you go down here, they can get away, take the pressure off. You walk down there to, and pretty soon they'll get to where they won't move as fast. Not because they're tired, it's just that they realize you're not gonna do anything to them. And so you, it's your responsibility to take that pressure off of them and let them know it's all right to interact with you, despite whatever happened to them before. So that's where going into sourcing cattle from somebody that understands stockmanship and these principles is important. Because if they've been handled correctly, when they get off the trailer in about five minutes, you're done. They understand communication, and then you're, you're set to go on your merry way in managing livestock. Thank you all very much, by the way. I'm proud of you for just bringing forward, too. All right. Um, the other, well, we'll talk about touch a little bit. You can communicate through touch on cattle. And that jokingly say you don't want to be rub their belly as they're running over you kind of deal. <laughs> <clears throat> but if cattle are in a lead up to a shoot and go to balking, most of the time we just get frustrated and go to whacking on them or something else, twist the tail. Take and push them off balance. If you think about it, when you're standing somewhere and somebody were to push you and you get off balance, what are you going to do? You take a step, reposition. So you start movement by getting them off balance. You just push on the hip pretty hard, and when they rock back and forth, a lot of times they'll start moving, particularly on gentle cattle. So that's something we can try to do as well when we work with these livestock, is just learn how to position ourselves where when we interact with them, they understand what we're talking about, they understand what we're asking, and they're more than willing to do it if they're not afraid of you. 